Nos acompaña Margaret Klein Salomon. Ella es fundadora, es fundadora y directora ejecutiva de la organización The Climate Mobilization. Margaret Klein Salomon obtuvo su doctorado en psicología clínica de la Universidad de Adelphi y también tiene una licenciatura en antropología social de Harvard. Aunque le encantaba ser terapeuta, Margaret se sintió llamada a aplicar su conocimiento psicológico y antropológico para resolver el cambio climático. En sus libros, Klein hace un llamado a entrar en modo de emergencia sobre el cambio climático, que es el modo de funcionamiento psicológico humano que ocurre cuando los individuos o grupos responden de manera óptima a emergencias existenciales o morales. Margaret también nos compartirá su experiencia como fundadora y directora ejecutiva de Climate Mobilization, desde donde trabaja estrategias para promover el Green New Deal, un conjunto de propuestas políticas para ayudar a abordar el calentamiento global y la crisis financiera de Estados en Estados Unidos, y así crear un camino hacia una movilización del nivel de la Segunda Guerra Mundial contra el cambio climático. Eh, y bien, sin más, dejamos a Margaret eh, compartirnos sus experiencias. Hi. Um... And thank you very much for having me. I'm extremely pleased uh, to be talking with you. I wish I was there, but uh, that was not possible. So I think that we can um, connect through uh, this universal struggle. I'm, I'm here in New York City. You're there, very different weather, I think, very um, different language, but uh, we're, we all are living on this uh, planet, which is in crisis. And what we're, one of the things we're realizing is that, um, you know, if my atmosphere is in an emergency, my climate is in an emergency, your climate is in an emergency. You know, uh, emissions over here uh, are destroying us all over here. So, um, yeah, so even though I, I am I am looking, I they have a, they've given me a camera so I can look and see the audience and yeah, so. Hello, and um, yeah, uh, so I'm a clinical psychologist by training, and I left that field six years ago to uh, found and direct the climate mobilization, or, or you know, when I, when I left, it was, you know, just to, to figure out what I could do um, in order to Uh, try and uh, cancel the apocalypse, as we say, just to do everything I could to try and protect humanity in the living world. Um, and so I bring that approach, that psychological approach to all of this work um, that I do at, at the climate mobilization, our, our political programming and And I have a book coming out in um, April of 2020. Uh, it's a self-help book called uh, Facing the Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth. So it's a, it's a self-help book for people to confront the truth about the climate emergency and critically to turn their pain into action, into, into effective action, emergency action. And, and that is uh, the theme of my talk tonight, pain into action on the climate emergency. And I think that's really kind of the core of what, our, what we need to do Um, as a political movement, but also as, I mean, just as countries, as uh, people. Uh, um, and so, yeah, so in the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk about pain and fear and grief and um, how hard all of this is. And then in the second half, I'm going to talk about effective action 
and how the climate mobilization has achieved what we've achieved and why I think it can be achieved anywhere. Um, okay, so, so the first section on the pain of the climate emergency is, you know, obviously it's a little, it's a little tough. Um, I'd like to talk about two painful feelings particularly, and that is um, grief and fear. Those are the two most prominent emotional reactions that people have to the climate emergency, though there's many, I mean, people have many varied contradictory uh, reactions to the climate emergency because that's that's the nature of the human psyche you know it's it's not rational it's emotional and all these you know uh like yeah our minds are kind of wild and untamed let's say um so it's so it's normal to feel anything about the climate emergency. There's no wrong feelings. And that's actually true, just generally speaking, right? That's like a psychological um, <laughs> truism. Uh, it's very, very healing to people in psychotherapy to, to learn that actually it's fine to think and feel anything, um, even, you know, cruel or, uh, you know, sexually perverse or what, I mean, whatever it, thoughts and feelings are, they, they don't, they don't hurt anyone. They just exist in our minds. What matters is how we react to them, how, what we do with them. So I, I, um, advise that we relate to our emotions. And again, this is about the climate emergency primarily but also anything. Um, but the, the way to relate to your emotions is to, to welcome them, to, to honor them, to show yourself uh, self-compassion, uh, which means to treat yourself with the loving kindness and gentleness that you would treat a, a dear friend. Um, so, so, yeah, so when you feel grief and terror or anything else about the climate uh i i advise you to say um yeah this is this is how i feel and it makes sense it's not it's not wrong and it's not crazy and it's it's in fact like when we feel grief because of the millions of people who have already died and been killed and the millions of species that are threatened with extinction and when we think about the you know how huge this emergency can be like the fact that it can kill billions of people and just totally destabilize uh, civilization. When we, when we think about that, it's, it's so painful. And it, it, you know, it can feel overwhelmingly painful. But we have to remember that that pain comes from the best parts of ourselves. The, the pain is there because we love each other and the living world and we don't want it to die. We don't want everyone and everything to die. And that is, that is a beautiful and moral and um, connected sentiment, right? We don't want... <laughs> We should not want to feel numb or happy or mellow as, you know, the Amazon rainforest is on fire. Like we should, that's not appropriate. We should feel this grief. It's, it's the right 
it, it it's right. It's at just just as it's right to grieve when someone you love has died or is in terrible danger. It is right to grieve in this moment. Um, the other uh, very, very, very important feeling is terror. Um, because, well, for one, the climate movement in the United States anyway, I can't, I, I, there's a lot that I don't know about your political situation and how the climate movement works. So I, I just, I'm going to have to talk about the conditions as I've found them here and you, you all will have to try and figure out <laughs> how to apply uh, those lessons. But in the United States, and I think it's global, but in the United States, there is a huge culture in the climate movement and climate discussion of, um, it's very intellectual, very rational, very scientific, very masculine, right? And this kind of makes sense. Uh, it was scientists who initially told us what was happening with the climate. Uh, they've been for a long time kind of at the center of how we think about and talk about climate. Plus then there's, you know, technology, solar and um, policy and, uh, you know, it's a lot of intellectual stuff. Um, but there's a particular culture uh, in science, particularly, that views emotions and like uh, expressing emotions as like very suspect, very, um, oh yeah, it, it's like dangerous. So that, uh, that tendency, um, David Spratt, who is a really important uh, critic of the IPCC um, talks about the IPCC's tendency towards least drama. So they 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 want they're conservative. They want to not not freak people out too much. Um, and so so this is but it's not just the IPCC. It's it's the the whole culture of of science, which is why they say things like. Um, well, we can't, you know, we can't be totally sure. We can't give total attribution of this, uh, you know, super storm to the climate emergency. We're not, we're not certain, you know, or like they, they want to qualify everything and really only make statements that they can be a hundred percent certain about, but, but so, and, and, and they don't want to sound um, irrational or hysterical, right? But the truth, we've ignored this crisis for so long that just saying the truth <laughs> is terrifying and it is emotional. So there's a kind of, um, yeah, there's, it's just a very strange kind of cultural phenomenon where people in the climate movement say, it was actually super common, but they say, whoa, whoa, don't say that. It's too scary. The, the, the climate movement, the legacy climate movement, environmental movement regularly tells people, organizers or um, journalists, they, say, they tell people, you can't scare people don't don't talk about these you know apocalyptic possibilities uh or don't don't talk about them they're too scary and 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 i i hear all the time all the time people say fear doesn't work as a motivator right fear doesn't work this is super commonly said within the american mainstream climate movement it's actually a basic assumption and it's it's bullshit. Um, fear fear is literally 
the most effective motivator, not just of humans, but of animals, right? Like fear is literally the mechanism through which we translate perception of a risk into a self-protective action, right? If we didn't feel fear, we would never have evolved to this stage. We would have been eaten by predators, you know, just because we weren't afraid. We would just stand there and they would, they would eat us, right? Like, uh, yeah, fear is a self-protective mechanism. And any attempt from a movement or, a, yeah, organizationally that says we, ne we need to stop people from feeling f very appropriate fear, it's like, whoa, that, yeah, I, I, I think that is um, a huge red flag. Um, okay, so... We, I, I've talked about the need to accept feelings and to welcome them and to honor them. And, but that's only, that's only the first step. They, we have to then turn them into action. It's, it's, it's not, this isn't um, you know, like spiritual bypass. We can't just like stay in the realm of the psychological. It, we have to feel those feelings and then use them to propel us into effective political engagement. Um, and that's, you know, that, it, that's a, it's a very natural, um, like, use of these feelings. It's, it's the most, it's the only one that makes sense. Um, so that is really, I think, the, the job of the movement is to help, help people, um, starting, starting with ourselves, really tap into that pain, get in, channel it, get in touch with it, express it, talk to other people about your climate feelings. This is really, really, really important. Really, really important to to say, to say, you know, to your friends and family and neighbors and colleagues, how do you feel about the climate emergency? I'm feeling really depressed or, or scared or angry or guilty or what, whatever. Um, and by having those conversations, you are, you're inviting a new part of the person into the conversation. I cannot tell you how many people have said to me, wow, no one ever asked me before how I felt about the climate emergency. And like, why is that? <laughs> why are we not talking about this? Um, so, so yeah, this is, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to move into the, into action section now, pain into action. Um, but the the homework from this section is to try and feel your feelings, like take some time and think about it and and like let them let them come in and then and try to just experience them mindfully and compassionately. That's step one. And then step two is talk to someone else about it. What do you feel about the climate emergency? Here's what I feel. Um, it's amazing. I, I mean, so simple. Sounds so simple, but it's really hard and it's um, very effective. Um, okay. So, um, uh, David, who invited me to uh, give this talk and uh, introduced me to the your work, um, which sounds extremely exciting uh, and effective. Um, asked me to talk about how did the climate mobilization get politicians to adopt our platform, 
And I think that's a great question. Um, and I am going to try to answer it. Um, uh, and first, I will give a uh, overview of what we have achieved as an organization. Um, and then I'm going to talk about kind of the lessons learned, um, what we can, yeah, what we can learn from that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do a screen share. Okay. So the climate mobilization has transformed uh, the policy discussion on climate in the United States. Uh, five years ago, when we launched, we were the only organization uh, calling for a World War II scale climate mobilization. Mm, sorry, there's a lot of text on this. Um, so, so yeah, when we when we started, it wasn't an original idea like other organizations and people had been talking about or recognizing that we need a World War II scale climate mobilization, you know, a huge all of society effort to rapidly transition to a zero carbon economy. Um, and, but we, at the, when we started, we referred to that uh, as a hidden consensus because while many leaders and thinkers understood this as the best approach, they weren't advocating for it, um, which was very strange to me, but I think I understand, I think I understand it. Um, and, but so, but so we, we did, we did the thing that everybody, many, many people said, yes, that is what is necessary. But we, for but we were the organization that said okay then that's what we're gonna do, <laughs> um, so for about four years we were pretty lonely, right? We were kind of the the movement was here, and we were like all the way out here, um, and but in during those years we had a lot of success, uh, kind of first slowly but then quickly. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, we have brought our concepts from the edge of uh, like the margins of politics into the mainstream. And particularly, like you see this in Bernie Sanders. Um, Bernie Sanders is calling for a World War II scale climate mobilization. He's calling for $16 trillion of spending for that. Um, it's still not good enough. He still doesn't meet our standards of what we're calling for, but we're very, very, very pleased to see that movement. Um, other, uh, the other candidates have, they're not, Bernie's is the strongest, but the other candidates have done some good, better things on climate. And then there's also, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Green New Deal that she introduced in the House of Representatives, which is, we were, we are very involved with, and it's, it, the Green New Deal contains a lot of our, um, ideas and positions. Um, so, and then, uh, uh, 80, 84 percent of Democrats, 63 percent of independent voters, and 18 percent of Republicans in the United States say climate is an emergency. Um, okay. So how did we do this, right? Uh, and, 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 the, and the truth is we didn't. We're, we're very, a very small organization, right? Like uh, now we have like eight people, but that's even, that's the largest we've been. So, we're, I mean, we're very small, full-time full people, and we have volunteers and organizers. But, but the way that we've been able to achieve that kind of success is by moving the movement, right? It's not, um, yeah, so like uh, Extinction Rebellion, for example, 
is a, a close ally. There, oh, this is that's my climate mobilization um, patch, and this is my extinction rebellion flag. Um, and uh, and we helped we helped influence them. We helped build them. Uh, uh, the Sunrise Movement, we helped kind of build and shape the Green New Deal, the youth climate movement with Greta Thunberg and these, you know, wonderful uh, young people, they have largely taken on our uh, framework and demands. Um, so, and, and uh, the most successful campaign that we as an organization have really, um, pushed ourselves rather rather than just uh, yeah working to influence other organizations this is one of our direct uh, campaigns is uh, climate emergency declarations um, we we got the first like 10 seven to ten declarations in the United States and then uh, asked extinction rebellion to um, to use that tactic um, of getting a getting a government to de formally declare a climate emergency, and they've they've been taking this totally exponential with um, you know, more than half of the local governments in the United Kingdom have now declared a climate emergency, as well as the United Kingdom itself, um, and governments around the world. Actually, I didn't I didn't look. Have any governments in Mexico declared a climate emergency? Do you know? Some have, I'm not sure. Let's get back to that. Um, so one uh, exciting impact of these different campaigns has been the media response. You might be aware that the Guardian um, newspaper has now changed its style guide to say it will only refer to, uh, it won't use the phrase climate change anymore, but climate emergency or climate breakdown. Um, I loved my favorite piece of media that I've seen is, um, on CNN, uh, vice president Pence, uh, was asked by the anchor several times, but what are you going to do about the climate emergency? And he was really kind of like, uh, surprised because, because the framing, the, the language is really important because everyone everyone knows that a government is supposed to respond to emergencies and by not doing so it's really uh quite a problem a, a much stronger indictment than just oh i'm not doing anything about climate change or i don't believe in it or whatever um so this year oh sorry this year, my organization's uh, goal is to create a mobilization fever, um, which means uh, uh, the intensity, the passion for climate mobilization is going to be off the chart at an 11, rather, you know, out of 10. Um, two historical examples that um, are, are inspiring to us are uh, the United States after Pearl Harbor was attacked, um, there was such strong support for war. It was a national consensus. And then uh, also after uh, the, at the beginning of the Civil War, when the Southern states attacked the North, there, there was a, uh, just a huge upsurge in the North for, um, we are going to win. Uh, we, we, we have to do this. This, this is our responsibility. We, uh, we will win. We can win at a, a level of uh, passionate intensity that, um, yeah, that we need to achieve once more. Um, okay, so so in terms of, so that's what we've achieved. Um, that's the, that's the overview. Um, but in terms of how and like how to translate, how to give recommendations, um, what I'd like to start with is with this idea of making the necessary possible. So, um, 
on uh, the left, uh, this side, um, if you start with the question of what is possible, then you get, um, well, you know, we could do like a really small carbon price, maybe, or maybe we could do um, some incentives for electric vehicles or something, right? You get these really, really small policies and um, they're, they just won't work. <laughs> they're not gonna be helpful. Um, so this is what the climate movement has been doing for 30 years. Um, and it has failed, um, and, but, and it's failed because winning slowly is the same as losing, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't matter how many little policies we pass. I suggest uh, that we can uh, evaluate uh, policies and platforms uh, by asking, if this was fully implemented, would it protect us from catastrophe, right? Would it prevent the collapse of civilization? And if the answer is no, then we shouldn't be advocating for it. It is not worth our time, okay? That it's a failed paradigm. And we need to move to this other approach which starts from the question, what is necessary to restore a safe climate and protect humanity and the living world? Okay, that's the only question that matters. I don't care if it's possible. What do we need? Okay, so when you really look at that question, and we did, we did about a year of research to try and just figure out what the situation is and how, what is needed. And what is very clear is that we're not, we're, if we're a car, we're over the cliff, right? The cliff is below us. So we don't need to hit the brakes. We need to reverse, okay, as quickly as possible. So what that means in terms of policy is a World War II scale mobilization. It means full participation. All everyone in society participates. It means massive, massive, massive spending, right? The government should spend without limit to save as much life as possible. So mobilization means putting everything on the line. It means restructuring the government as necessary. It means uh, the immediate ban on new fossil fuel infrastructure, all new fossil fuel infrastructure, and a 10 year scale out uh, early retirement of what we have now. And a massive scale up of renewables. It means banning factory farms, transitioning to all organic agriculture in five years, banning pesticides. I mean, we need to make huge, huge, rapid shifts. So um, if that's your approach, then you keep your imagination open. You don't foreclose and say, oh, it's not possible, it's not possible but you make it possible and you, you demand it and you keep demanding it. And then the demand for mobilization increases. Okay. Um, oh. All right, so you start by saying what is necessary. And you develop a platform, right? And it should be as, um, as developed, as complete as possible. Like, of, uh, not, it, it should be a set of demands, right? 
we we need this 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 and this but not just a set of demands it also has to be um a story right that's like the world war ii mobilization it's a it's a metaphor it's a historic narrative um and it so so when politicians like bernie sanders or alexandria ocasio-cortez do want to use this they can right it's kind of easy for them to step into it because we've developed so much of it with you know policy from policy documentation and development to uh yeah the language uh and narrative aspects um okay uh so just i actually i realize i have one more thing to show you um which is just this slide which is um uh, this is our this is our victory plan. This is our uh, policy uh, document. This is, is it's a 100 page PDF that lays out like people ask, what do you mean World War II scale climate mobilization? And it talks about what what those policies uh, would actually would actually contain. Um, Okay, and that's available on our website for people who are interested in a closer policy look. Okay, so you develop an ultra aggressive platform, right? It's It has to be transformative, transform every sector of the economy, 10 years to zero emissions or and draw down negative emissions, right? So you, you get your ultra strong platform and then you stick with it right and you this is this is kind of a hard part um because in the climate movement in the united states anyway there's a lot of pressure to like be nice um to like uh work together um and support one another and so, so my organization was kind of viewed, I think, as kind of maybe like jerks, um, because we would not join anything that was less than what we were calling for, right? So we would not join a sign-on letter to a politician, or yes, yeah, or sign a sign a petition, or. Um, join a protest nothing if it didn't share our demands again 10 years to zero emissions or or faster uh world war ii scale climate mobilization declare a climate emergency if those if the, if it didn't include that sorry we're not interested um and uh we were willing to be publicly critical um, so for example, um, Bernie Sanders, uh, who I've been talking about, um, fair amount, uh, but he, Bernie Sanders in 2016 said, we need World War II scale climate mobilization. So we thought, yeah, that's great. Like, good job, Bernie. Um, but then in 2017 in the Senate, he introduced the, um, 100 by 50 act which means um 100 renewable by 2050 in the united states and it's like I, I really i really get very frustrated by this because world war ii and 2050 do not go together right world war ii happened in less than 10 years in the u.s it happened in less than five years and so you don't you don't fight a world war over 30 years it doesn't so so uh you know bernie had built this incredible movement and he was very very popular he still is very very popular amongst the climate movement and 
the, so the climate movement was so excited and celebratory of his 100 by 50 act. And they said, oh, this is what we all have to get behind. And we were the only organization that said, no, it's not good enough. We were the only environmental organization to go to the UN and protest the Paris Agreement as it's insufficient. I mean, if it's not going to protect humanity from collapse, we shouldn't be celebrating it. So, um, okay, so yeah, you need to uh, make a big platform, a transformative platform, and uh, hold fast to it. Don't compromise and um, yeah, make everybody come to you, right? So you need to be very, very, very stubborn. Um, but it's uh, it's it's highly effective. Uh, another uh, one instance I want to raise is um, Extinction Rebellion in the United Kingdom had a lot of success in um, they uh, occupied Greenpeace uh, their headquarters in in London and they said like Greenpeace what are you doing like you you're 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 losing this battle you got to come join us in the streets. And it really worked. I mean, Greenpeace has really changed and is one of the best large organizations in the space now. Um, so yeah, uh, one of my favorite books about campaigning is called um, Raising Expectations. Oh, ex excuse me, it's called uh, Rules for Revolutionaries by Zach Exley and Becky Bond, who were on the Bernie Sanders campaign. They were his organizers for him. And um, one of the things they say is that um, people are more willing and more excited to devote themselves in a big way to a big cause than in a small way to a small cause. And that so, um, that really impacted uh, the organizers at Extinction Rebellion. Uh, for they, they that that helped them think, okay, well, we should call for like the whole, the whole transformative vision, right? And we we feel the same way that it's we're in such a moment of crisis now that it's not we just we can't think step by step incremental. We have to go, you know, uh, upside down. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's really about, it's really about leaving, it's really about changing paradigms, changing, um, from a gradualist paradigm into a emergency paradigm. Oh, and I actually, I have... Uh, one more slide, which covers this. Okay. Um, okay, so my organization has um, three verticals, three like program areas. Uh, climate mobilization is like our think tank. So we call it the head. Um, climate truth vertical. This is the psychology vertical and about my book. So we call it the heart and uh, climate emergency vertical is our uh, action vertical. So we call it like the hands. Okay, and in each of these programs, we are going to change the paradigm. Okay, so we're, the intellectual paradigm is that we're creating is we need emergency mobilization, right? Transformation at emergency speed, not gradualism. As I said, the government should spend without limit to save as much life as possible. And um, yeah, to, uh, it's, it's not just a climate crisis, it's a climate crisis and a broader ecological crisis. And also, uh, we are our, our goal our aim is to restore a safe climate and that means zero degrees of warming not one 1 1.5 or two we want to go down um okay so that's the that's the intellectual paradigm shift that we're creating 
But then we're also doing an emotional paradigm shift. And that's what I, I started with. I talked about um, feel your feelings, um, use your pain, uh, talk with other people, break the silence. And then also um, the fact that like, this is our responsibility, not, not because we, it's our fault, but because I, that's the, I think that's the re moral reality of being alive at this time is that this, this crisis is happening and, and no, nobody else is solving it. So we have to do it. Um, and uh, then finally, the, the, um, how to act, changing the paradigm for action is this is an emergency. So we need to, to reflect that in our actions. Um, we need to build political power, collective power, right? Not individual like self purification through, um, oh, you know, I, whatever, being vegan and uh, being, uh, you know, zero carbon and zero waste. And I mean, that's, that's fine, but it's, but the solution has to be political. It has to be a political movement. Um, and as I've discussed, um, people say, people say uh, sometimes like, isn't it better than nothing? Isn't this law or this carbon price or whatever, isn't it better than nothing? And uh, it's not, it's, it's not, it's uh, it, the, the time for uh, small or weak or incremental solutions, it's just, it's just over. And uh, the only thing that can help us now is huge, huge transformative solutions. So let's make it happen. Um, it's, that's our job. Um, Okay, so uh, that's, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening and I will take some questions. Pues primero, gracias por hablar de emociones y todo eso porque normalmente no se habla y por ahí va mi pregunta, eh, si normalmente no hablamos de lo que estamos sintiendo sobre la causa que estamos eh, peleando, ya sea el cambio climático, la movilidad, ¿cómo deberíamos empezar a hablar de eso con nuestros grupos? ¿No? Porque normalmente sí nos reunimos para pensar en acciones, ¿no? en política pública, pero no estamos hablando normalmente, no sé en los grupos de aquí cómo funcione, pero normalmente no nos reunimos para platicar o hablar de cómo nos estamos sintiendo eh, ante tanta agresividad allá en la calle, ante, ante tanta frustración o que nos están ignorando o que no se está haciendo lo suficiente. ¿no? Sí tenemos que hablar también de eso porque creo que también es muy importante y la verdad me encantó que hayas eh, hablado de esto y pues ya. So one… Um exercise uh, that I recommend and I am happy to share uh, like a guide for, um, but it's called pain into action. It's very simple. Um, it can take under an hour um, and you need a facilitator, but uh, it can be it, just anybody who has a little bit of experience facilitating discussions. Um, and everybody, like five people, approximately five, six, seven, everybody says has three minutes to just share some feelings uh, about the climate emergency. And all the facilitator does is remind them if they start talking about uh, like, technology or politics and policy, like, oh, let's, you know, go back to emotions. Um, so yeah, everybody talks for three minutes just about their own experience. And then you go around once more in a circle. And this time everybody has two minutes to talk about what they can do, how they're going to get involved. Now, 
if you're talking about bringing this into an organization that already has activists, right? These people are already um, going to meetings and doing actions, then you can you can change that part into like, what are we going to do? Or like, in what ways can we increase our commitment and our efficacy, our, our effectiveness? Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not um, hard or I mean, it's painful, but it's not complicated to get these conversations going. You just need uh, um, a little bit of time and uh, somebody to uh, invite um, the discussion and uh, yeah, that I mean, they, we talk about in psychology, like holding, holding and containing the group, just um, being, being there, um, and yeah, be uh, being able to witness and uh, tolerate the pain. It's a, it's a, yeah. I, I really, I really hope that you do um bring that into your meetings it can be it can be very short um it can be less than you can do it um people have two minutes to talk about their feelings about the climate emergency or even one minute and um but it can if it's regular right a, a normal part of the organization involves talking about feelings and it doesn't it, it doesn't just have to be about the climate emergency also um uh, by sharing those feelings someone can also say you know uh my marriage is in trouble <laughs> you know like um it, it it can help like open us up um generally and uh yeah just be be more like fully engaged, like we don't need to like separate so entirely like, oh, personal life, uh, career and like politics or, uh, you know, climate work. These, these, we can bring these things together, bring our, our passion for protecting life into our family and uh, career and Sí, está okay. um, Bueno, antes que nada, gracias por la plática. Eh, yo soy biólogo y me gustaría más bien preguntar en grupos no especializados, um, ¿cómo empezar con personas que parece que no sienten nada por el cambio climático? No sienten miedo, no sienten preocupación… Ok, ¿Cómo, ¿cómo trabajar con, con personas que pues parece que no sienten nada? ¿no? Personas que no son especialistas en el tema y ¿cuál es tu experiencia con ese tipo de, de, de grupos? ¿no? Yo como biólogo… <risas> eh, sí me siento comprometido con con este tema y es, es frustrante, ¿no? Eh, pues, ¿qué hacer con esos grupos que pues, realmente están cegados, ¿no? Por, con otro mundo que pues se está cayendo pedazos y no lo ven. Uh, yeah, ok, uh, it's a good question. Um, so, I think there's different, um, Okay, first of all, I think people care. I think everybody cares. Like, why? Uh, because, <laughs> because everything is in danger, 
Um, and I think that on some level, people know. Um, I'm not, I, I guess some people don't, actually don't know or don't care. But I think what looks like not caring is actually some other uh, things, such as especially hopelessness and helplessness. Um, like one thing I hear a lot um, in the United States when I talk to people about climate is um, we're fucked. Um, <clears throat> and it's really, it's really upsetting. I, I mean, I want to say, and I do say, do you know what that means? Like, do you know what you're talking about? You're talking about the deaths of billions of people, quite possibly you and your family. Like, and you're just, it's just, oh, it's just, you're just giving up. Like, that's ridiculous. That's horrible. Like, it's, um, so, uh, but, but I think that attitude, it's, yeah, there's just a level of despair, um, despair in the political system, right? That it could ever do anything right. Um, despair in like human nature. I hear a lot of really negative stuff about humanity, right? We, uh, like we deserve it. We're just, we're just inherently destructive and we destroy everything and, there's no, there's no other way, right? We're so greedy. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, so I don't, I, yeah, I think what looks like not caring, um, is really much more often not having any hope. Um, and, and not, and also, I mean, People are so disconnected um, from, like, I don't know, like the web of life, uh, the and the inter the interrelatedness of all humans and life, um, so that it can feel like, um, oh, the environment, the climate, uh, ecosystems, these are not, these are separate from me. <laughs> Um, and it's, uh, it's an illusion. It's, it's not true. So anyway, um, but in terms of how to start the conversation or to have the conversation, I think, I mean, I think this is actually a, it's, I think it's good. I think it's good but to, um, to sh lead with your feelings. Right. So talk about talk about um, what it feels like to see more and more species become extinct um, and to know that that is accelerating. And as a biologist, just how it how it feels for you. And, you know, by by framing it that way, you're not asking them for anything. You're not pressuring them. To, for anything, you're just sharing something personal. And it's not, it's not an opinion. It's not a factual claim. It's something from your heart. Um, and unless the person is like, you know, yeah, real jerk, uh, they, you know, that, it, that resonates. Like people are, people are able to hear that um, in a way that sometimes they can't hear other messages. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, I wanna say one more thing on this question, which is this is all changing very, very fast. Like, People like where our um, societies, cultures, uh, governments, the movement, these things are changing really quickly. Um, so some people, say, some people say to me, when I've talked to my family in the past, 
they haven't been worried or something like that. And I always say, well, when's the last time you spoke with them? Because a lot of people are afraid this year who weren't afraid last year. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, it's really growing. So, so sometimes, um, so yeah, don't, you don't, don't give up on somebody uh, you know, there was, there is a time not too long ago. Uh, yeah. Seven years ago when eight years ago, I, when I would have said, Oh, I don't know. It's pretty boring stuff, right? Climate change. I don't know. I don't, it's not really my thing yet. Like, so uh, people, people change and these are really fast changing times. So, uh, yeah, just keep that in mind. Eh, la pregunta es si tiene experiencia de comunicar estos temas o sabe cómo comunicar estos temas en un contexto de países de bajos y medianos ingresos. No sé quién está escribiendo. Ah, y lo pregunto porque la mayoría de la gente aquí está en situación de pobreza. de supervivencia. Entonces, esas son las masas que van a votar y los políticos están más preocupados por temas de justicia social, sobre todo en la 4T, que por la crisis climática. Entonces, no es un tema de nada más de hopelessness o de desconecte, es más, están preocupados por otras cosas. Entonces, por sobrevivir, básicamente. Ciclistas actuales, menos del 5% les importa el medio ambiente para pedalear, por ejemplo. No, en, de las, del perfil ciclista, las motivaciones por las que usan la bicicleta es porque es más barato, no porque es bueno para el medio ambiente. Um, so, no, I don't have experience really outside of the United States um, in communicating about the climate emergency, um, unfortunately. Um, however, I definitely, it's not, I mean, the United States is like both a rich country and a poor country because we have this like horrible uh, wealth inequality. So there are many, many people and communities in the United States who feel um, that, that, that they need, that they have greater emergencies than climate, right? That like that, that their need to feed their family this week and pay rent is, you know, a, a, a constant crisis. And so it, it makes sense that, um, that if you are struggling to uh, achieve basic uh, health and st stability and security, you can't spend your time and energy focusing on saving civilization and all life. I, I mean, that I understand that. That makes sense. But I think what we can do, and it seems like what you are doing with bicycling, um, but is show that these problems can be solved together, right? Like for example, uh, in, in our uh, call for World War II scale climate mobilization, one of, one of the, our uh, uh, parts of our platform is that the federal government should guarantee every American a job 
in the mobilization. There's, there's so much to do, so much to build, so much renewable energy to build, so, we, so much, so much um, in order to save energy, we need to uh, insulate and, and retrofit every home and building, right? So there's, we're gonna create millions of jobs and we can, that like, that so, so everybody can and should be able to take part in this mobilization and get a living wage in doing so. So, so that's one example, but there's many more that, that, um, that as we, what, what we need to protect humanity and the world is to transform into a regenerative society and economy. And in doing that, I mean, we, we are literally talking about a new world, new energy, new agriculture, new transportation, new urban planning, new uh, community uh, relationships and resiliency, new international order, new everything, right? And this is our chance. This is our chance to create a better world. It, we have to. <laughs> because if we don't, we are, it, we will absolutely collapse. Um, but it's, it's not, it, it, it is also an opportunity. And so I, I think to, um, to bring in, uh, one thing we talk about at the climate mobilization is um, maximum fear, maximum hope that these two ideas actually are not opposites. They're not in contradiction with each other. We can have both, right? That's, I, I think it's realistic to have both because it comes from an understanding that this world that we're living in today is done. It is over. It, 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 uh, maybe it has, five years left before it, like it's totally gone. I don't know, 10 years left, I don't know. But it's, it can either um, just collapse, just crash, or we can transform. Those are the only two options. And um, so, so to, to, to make common cause with people who are in desperate conditions, by, by saying, uh, yeah, let's, it's time to build a new world. Let's do it. Maybe, maybe we should do one more. Solo preguntarle qué opina de Greta Thunberg. Oh. Um, so yeah, uh, the question, what do I think about Greta? I love Greta. Um, yeah, I feel I so I was sad uh, when because Greta was in New York City, but I couldn't I couldn't get a meeting with her. I tried, but um, but why I wanted to is um, because I I feel really a um, like a kinship kindred spirits with her, um, like yeah, like for example. Um, one of my, one of my, uh, my, my, let's say most, most read paper, most important paper is called leading the public into emergency mode. Um, and it, it starts, it says, imagine there is a fire in your house. What, what do you think about? What do you, what do you do? And you just, I, 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 yeah, I use a lot the metaphor of fire in your house. And Greta talks about a fire in, in the house. And some 
in the like uh, paranoid right wing media have have said um, have said I am like controlling Greta or manipulating her or um, uh, whatever somehow something nefarious. Um, but uh, but the truth is I don't I'm not aware that Greta has ever heard of me or, or read my writing. Um, I, I would love it. I would love it if she had, I would feel so proud. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think that, I think that really good ideas, um, are often developed in like by different people in different parts of the world, uh, at like a similar time. Um, because because they're just right, you know? Um, I think, I think that, um, for me, I, I, I okay, an, I, another way to look at it, I think is, why can Greta see something and, and why can my, I, me and Greta and some others, but why can we see the emergency for what it is and call it an emergency and not not be um not be afraid to make others uncomfortable not be afraid to, when other people say oh it's uh whatever calm down or something um and for for greta it's she said it's because of her um asperger's uh her you know, being on the autism spectrum, uh, she said, um, she said, I'm glad I have autism because if I didn't, I would be like the rest of you, uh, playing the social game. Um, and, but she's, she doesn't play the social game. Uh, she just, uh, is telling the truth and living her mission. And, and I think for, for me, um, because my, so uh, I'm a clinical psychologist, but even more than that, my father is a clinical psychologist and a psychoanalyst. Um, and so I grew up in a very psychoanalytic community and have been in my own psychotherapy for more than 15 years, like almost forever. Um, so I think that, I, I think that that's for me how I was able to see the truth. And I think Greta has a different way to see the truth. But I think that the truth is, yeah, the house is on fire. This is an emergency. We need to change everything. Kind of simple. So yeah, I love Greta. Es una pregunta súper rápida. Quiero saber cuál es tu pronóstico eh, para todo este tema de la emergencia climática si en las próximas elecciones de Estados Unidos se reelige Donald Trump. Yeah, um, if Trump is elected again in the United States, I, I think, I, I will have to reevaluate this at the time, but I think I will switch and try to take as much of the organization as will follow me into Extinction Rebellion. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, it's just, it's so, it's so horrible. The, I mean, the, the, um, Trump and the Republican Party generally, and just, I mean, our global economy and global political system, it's all, it's all um, beyond repair, right? It's, 
it's irredeemable and we need something new. Um, so yeah, my, my hope, my fervent hope is that we can create that mobilization fever in the United States before the next election because anybody who's um, afraid for their family and afraid for themselves will not vote for a Republican. Um, that's it. I mean, yeah. So, so my, yeah, I mean, obviously we have to do everything that we can to avoid um, him being reelected, but if he is, yeah, it's, um, I think we'll have to, uh, take take the fight to a, a different level. Um, yeah, that's a really depressing question to to end with. Um, we we just we just have to uh, we can't let it happen. We can't. We 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 just cannot let it happen. And I mean that. And that's true for the Trump election. And that's true for. Uh, just allowing this climate emergency to get worse and worse and worse every year. Like that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the, the takeaway, right? Like we, we cannot let this happen. So let's, let's uh, make the necessary possible. Uh, Uh, yeah, so yeah, thanks so much, everybody. This has been a very, uh, a great pleasure. Um, and I, I, I wish I was there. <laughs>